Good evening, everyone. So welcome to our live session. And um, this is our first live session in 2021. So I just want you all to know that we are streaming simultaneously on Facebook as well as YouTube. Um, this session is being recorded and it's gonna be available on both the DCAG-T and the DCSD websites. I am Becca Coster and I will be your moderator this evening. So before we get started, um, let me tell you a little bit about the Douglas County Association for Gifted and Talented. Um, it is a 501c3 nonprofit. We're an all volunteer organization made up of family members, educators, and community members. And we're an affiliate of the Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented. Our purpose is to foster an understanding of all gifted children, including twice exceptional children and their educational and social emotional needs. We advocate for gifted children through partnerships with educators, parents, administrators, as well as legislators. And we um, support the educational and social emotional well being of gifted children, their families, as well as their caregivers. So um, I definitely want to honor your time this evening. So I'm going to take a few moments to introduce our guests. Um, we have Michelle Oslick, and she is a team lead for gifted education in the Douglas County School District. And we have Heather Groff. She's also a team lead for gifted education in Douglas County School District. So Michelle and Heather are going to be presenting for the first half of the session. And then during the second half, we're going to be open for um, questions and answers. So welcome, Michelle and Heather. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Becca, for having us. And welcome everybody. Thank you all for joining us as well. Um, and tonight we're gonna talk a bit about executive functioning um, and gifted students. Um, but before getting to executive functioning itself, I think one thing that's really important to talk about is asynchronous development. And when we talk about asynchronous development, we're talking about um, development of um, a child in a lot of different realms, um, whether that be physical, um, academic, their executive functioning skills, social emotional, pretty much um, all the different categories of skills a human has as they develop. And when we're talking about asynchrony or asynchronous development, it's that concept that we all develop at different rates. So that while one person may develop um, their executive functioning skills at a quicker rate than their um, social emotional skills or their academic skills in another person that may happen in reverse. And this is especially true for our gifted, um, our gifted children that as they develop their academic skills, possibly at a faster rate or acquire um, more depth of knowledge and um, various aspects of that academic realm in comparison to their typical peers, their executive functioning skills or perhaps some of their social emotional skills may develop at a slower rate versus their atypical peers, thus creating asynchrony, that they have one area developing faster um, and hitting different milestones than they do another area of their development. And so thinking about that, you know, what is executive functioning? Um, executive functioning is a concept that you can find lots of different, different definitions for. Um, for our purposes this evening, we're going to talk about executive functioning as the different mental processes that really allow for the control of our behavior, um, for emotional control, flexibility, um, being able to set a goal, your goal-directed persistence, metacognition, um, organization, planning, um, response inhibition, being able to sustain your attention, task initiation, time management, working memory, and stress tolerance. Let's talk about those a little bit more because some of those terms may seem very foreign. Um, metacognition, really being able to um, think about your own thinking, to be able to take that bird's eye view of yourself in a situation or what's happening, to really think through how you're solving a problem, being able to self-monitor, self-evaluate. Really, that's what we're talking. We're talking about metacognition. Um, goal-directed persistence is just being able to not only set your own goal, but to be able to pers um, persist in achieving that goal going through the process, okay? And not being able to, or not being um, distracted by 
other interests or putting it off, um, but really being able to follow through. Emotional control, when we're talking about executive functioning skills, really able to being able to regulate and manage your emotions to achieve your goals or just really to live your everyday life. Flexibility, to be able to revise your plan, um, to be able to change and uh, no matter what the obstacles or setbacks, um, whether you have new information, make mistakes, have some failure. Sustained attention is exactly what it sounds like. Just being able to continue to maintain your attention during a task or in a, situa a situation, despite the other factors that might be playing on you. Um, response inhibition, that ability to think before you act. Okay. Organization, it's not only the ability to create systems, but also to maintain systems um, that track your information, your materials in a way that's effective. Um, so your systems need to actually work, not just be able to create them and maintain them, but then they're also effective. You have task initiation, which is the ability to begin projects um, without undue procrastination, not that there's none, but um, without undue procrastination in a timely manner. And again, that's efficient and effective. Okay. Working memory, Let's be able to hold information in your memory while performing complex tasks. And then stress tolerance, um, definitely something that um, we're all having ch a challenge with, I'm sure, right now and over the past year, being able to thrive in stressful situations, being able to cope and um, really still function, no matter the uncertainty, change, or the demands that we have and what we've been asked to do. Um, time management. Estimating how much time you have, being able to allocate the time that you have, and to stay within your time limits and deadlines and be able to complete the tasks, achieve the goals that you need to. And then last but not least, that planning and prioritization, um, being able to create that roadmap to reach your goal, complete a task, um, and make the decisions that on what's important, not important, and that will get you where you need to be. So those are really the executive functioning skills that we as humans need to develop through a lifetime um, to be able to really perform and live in our society and culture today. And those, when we talk about executive functioning, those skills are what we're referring to. So let's take a little bit of a look at what that um, development looks like. Um, I love this graphic and um, it talks about from your five to year 22 about how executive functioning really changes um, from a five-year-old really having um, no, their, their inhibition of their impulses really dominates, um, not being able to control those impulses, their executive functioning skills are really usually at a very rudimentary level, relying on others to support them. Um, going through when we get to that mid-childhood where there's an increase in working memory, attention, flexibility, um, and keeping on going till when they hit about age 12, there is a developmental spurt of growth setting skills right around that sixth grade as they start middle school of being able to um, set goals for themselves, being able to follow through and start to be able to plan. And there's an ongoing increase in planning skills for quite some time. Um, and around 14, the same thing happens with their working memory um, and being able to being able to store things and remember things as well as perform complex tasks at the same time. Okay, and the same during this time too. It, um, when you look at this graphic, you can see um, that boys tend to have higher levels of attentional capacity and working memory um, to 11 to 14, but that changes right around in there too, as far as the gender crossover. Um, and this keeps on going. There's another developmental spurt at age 16 with attention and their attention capacity. Okay. Um, and really from 16 to 18, we see the, the planning. Um, oops. There we go, the planning Sorry. skills, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> reaching, reaching maturity. Um, so at this age, um, a typically developing um, child at this point, a teenager, is most more likely to give weight to pros um, over cons when making decisions. Okay. And as you can see, executive functioning continues to develop um, well into um, your early 20s. And in all honesty, um, when we think about what's happening in the brain with 
the pairing of synapses and um, how the brain develops, executive functioning skills continue to change um, quite a bit all the way through your 20s and develop and refine um, into what we normally think of as adult level abilities as far as executive functioning skills. And just when we think about this through school levels, um, we can think about in elementary, students really tend to, they are able to follow checklists, follow routine, um, games that require strategy. They're starting to develop ways to control their behavior. Um, most kids will follow most rules. Um, they're developing sense of time and the ability for some self-reflection. And the amount of support that students need at the elementary level with each of these can vary greatly. Again, that asynchronous development. Some students may be quite independent, very young in elementary with some of these, and others may need additional support um, all the way through their elementary years. And then when we look at middle school, they're really learning that use of planning. They're starting to understand consequences of lack of preparation, really just consequences in general, and how that affects them, they themselves, the people around them. Um, they're starting to be able to manage more complex schedules and being more flexible in changes of routine, um, independent in sports and games. And we usually do see an increase in empathy. Um, we know that starting in kindergarten, students really do are just aware of themselves um, as their center. And then as every age, every year as they get older and age, they start having a greater sense of those around them, their impact on others, um, others' emotions, um, that others do have emotions, um, and then continuing to develop and really in, in middle schools where we see that increase in empathy um, towards others um, really start to take shape um, in greater strides. And then also being able to make deeper connections from their new learning. And then we move on to high school and really their independence managing school and social life with their responsibilities and most importantly, minimally with adult support starting to transition um, to that adult responsibility, being able to independently plan, okay, short-term, long-term projects, um, collaboratively work with groups to plan and share responsibilities. They're better able to manage distractions, um, not just with work and task, but also within their planning and being able to um, set their goals and be able to move through long-term goals without those distractions that come along the way. Okay, they're more flexible and resilient in changes. Um, and really that risk-taking behavior may increase, um, but some may recognize and seek support. Okay. Heather, anything you wanna add in there? Um, no, I think uh, those are all different. The, the One of the key aspects is how much adult support they need mm -hmm. at all of these different levels. And remembering that even our high school students may be um, still, impacted by that asynchronous development. So they may be behind in some of these skills where we would anticipate they would be performing maybe at the high school level, but they are really um, performing at that middle school level. So even at that time, this, this asynchrony can, can follow them all the way through school. Um, and then I'll uh, bring up some common issues at school, and I'm gonna break this into kind of four really basic kind of domains. And the thing about executive functioning skills is that the higher the skill, they actually cross over into different areas. So while I've given this a, you know, four categories, um, they kind of may fit into another one. So when you look at um, regulatory and it control or being able to inhibit your behavior. Um, we see blurting or, you know, shouting out the answer um, before raising their hand or following those um, ex expectations at school. Inability to manage time. And that can be um, anything from not you know, not being able to plan so that we're going to recess and then, you know, being able to plan through your day um, or just being able to finish a task. Um, becoming overly emotional, a lot of times um, that can have a lot of different reasons, um, but it could be that executive functioning piece that, that could be triggering that as well. Um, when you talk about attention, um, starting and completing tasks, 
um, that could actually weigh into some working memory as well. But um, sometimes they're just really unorganized. Um, they, we've probably all seen the messy desk or backpack, and that is your classic, um, what many people see as gifted kids being um, impacted with executive functioning. Having trouble planning or keeping track of their assignments. Um, many of these kids um, actually do their homework, but then forget to turn it in, or can't find their paper, or it's crumpled at the bottom of your backpack. Um, it never makes it to where it's supposed to go. Um, for working memory, things like um, forgetting the information that they've been told or that they just read, um, following directions, particularly multi-step directions. Um, they're just unable to kind of hold that into their memory long enough to get through it. Um, and inability to start a task. Uh, sometimes that weighs in again with um, either attention or um, not being able to hold everything in there. So if you give too many instructions at one time, they're not able to go back to step one because they just process step three. Um, cognitive flexibility, um, panicking when the rules or the routines change, um, difficulty switching between tasks. Um, these are those kids that are really into solving their math problems and it's time to transition to writing and they have a really hard time moving to that task because they're not finished with the other one. Um, but they can also fixate easily on things that they're interested in. And then when you look at some common issues at home, I've highlighted some that are similar to what you might see at school, um, and then others that, that may look a little different. So the inability to balance responsibility and leisure time, um, maybe possibly uh, engaging in risky behavior. Um, sometimes that's your little daredevils, not thinking about the fact that, you know, I need to wear my helmet when I ride a bike and um, they just take off and, and not think about consequences. Um, may display strong justice or lack of empathy, um, particularly with siblings, um, you know, feel like they are reacting before they think about um, why someone did something or, um, you know, what might be causing that particular emotion. Um, they express big emotions themselves. Um, often they might not make sense according to the situation. Um, attentional control, uh, think about difficulty saving money, even when it's for something that they want. Um, that goes again, maybe into that um, impulse control that they decide, oh, I don't want to save my money. I want, I want to do this now. Um, they're unorganized, messy workspace, bedrooms, backpacks. Um, I have two teenagers myself. Sometimes I can't even get into bedrooms to see what they look like. So instead of the messy backpack, now we have the messy uh, workspace from being at home. Um, having trouble planning or keeping track of assignments is also the same. You see it from this end, on the parent end, from um, kids waiting to the last minute um, oh my gosh, I just realized I have this um, due and I haven't uh, planned well enough to get it done in the time limit. Working memory, um, they may give you that blank look or seem inattentive to an adult directive, but a lot of times adults like to be very verbose and we may give directions or um, say, you know, give our reasoning and somewhere the instructions get lost along the way. And uh, that could possibly be just not being able to hold on to what the, the crux of the conversation was supposed to be. Um, difficulty following directions, again, especially multi-step directions, or inability to start a task. 
when you think about cognitive flexibility, that panicking um, when routines and rules change. However, we may see it um, in a very different way than they would see it at school. Um, sometimes that could be angry, um, frustration, um, tears, um, and they may actually express um, some digging in their heels and being able not, you know, refusing to um, change the routine the way that you want them to change it. Um, they may have difficulty accepting the parent ways of approaching tasks. So that's uh, when you get the, but my teacher does it this way. This is our math program and this is how we do it and we don't do it this other way. Um, so not being able to be flexible to op and open to other ideas and difficulty problem solving past their black and white thinking. So some of them stick, uh, hold firm to those rules and this is the way it is and it's this way or that way, it can't be any other way. So then we have some tools and some resources for you. Um, the really good news is that these skills can be taught they need to be practiced and they absolutely can be strengthened. So the three key pieces are that children need to buy in and basing it on their own values. Why do they want to change? Well, maybe it's, you know, you might find it to be a problem, but they may not actually find it to be a problem. So finding a way to have them understand how this is going to benefit them uh, approaching as a science experiment, especially with young students, um, encourage that problem solving by making hypotheses and testing solutions. So for example, if you were trying um, to teach about time and managing your time, you could sit down with them and say, well, okay, how long do you think this piece of homework is going to take? And they'll say, oh, 10 minutes. So you write down 10 minutes and then you time it and see whether it actually took 10 minutes, whether it took five minutes or 30 minutes. And then that helps develop that, that sense of time um, and then testing different solutions to see what works. Um, separate the struggles from the child. So name the challenge. Um, students need to know that this is not them, that it's something that they are um, working with that they are something the challenge that they need to manage so it, it's not a defect it's you know it's not because they're lazy or or um, they're procrastinating because they're a procrastinator sometimes it's they don't know how to get started and so figuring out what those struggles are and then talk about the advantage of trying something new it's not that you want the child to change, you want the behaviors to change. Um, and then sift through the emotions that are attached to those particular ways. Um, a lot of times kids don't want to change. And, you know, what, what's the emotion around that? Why, why do they feel that way? And then pr provide support without enabling. So, targeting only one skill at a time. Once you get that one under control, then you can introduce another skill. Um, establish reasonable expectations for both parent and child. So a child who's been really um, enmeshed in this behavior is not gonna change overnight. And we need to have that expectation as a parent and be able to support our kids in understanding that it's not going to change overnight. Support them enough to encourage their growth. Um, we want to give them just enough supports, but we want to try not to rescue them. Um, now is the time for them to learn how to problem solve through these issues. And then we have a bunch of resources that we'd like to share with you. Um, the, Michelle, you can help me out here. The um, executive function developmental chart. That one um, 
unlike the one that I shared before that was a nice simple graphic, it really goes in depth for each area for different, um, different ages with some real specific bullet points of what that might look for. Okay. There's the um, NAGC handout about asynchronous development if you'd like to know a little bit more about that, how that looks, um, especially for gifted learners. Um, and um, Seth Perler is um, an executive functioning expert, and um, there's a free executive functioning quiz that you can take as a parent, and it gives you an idea. Um, it rates on one to four the sense of urgency um, um, how to intervene with your child. And then there's also a student based one that your child could take, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, is really cool. And then we have some articles for you, um, different types of, uh, you know, tips for parents. Um, how does, uh, a child with executive functioning, um, think differently, um, why do gifted students often struggle in schools? And it has a lot to do often with executive, um, these executive functioning skills, um, how to engage them in gifted learners. And this article, Why You Should Stop Rescuing Your Teen and What to Do Instead is one of my favorites. Um, I am, sorry about that guys, I'm losing control of my computer. Um, I am one of those that, you know, had needed to be reminded to make sure that I um, didn't over intervene with my kids. And Michelle, you want to talk about some of the books? And some of these books um, listed here are easily found, um, easily found on Amazon or at the library. Um, Late Lost and Unprepared is a great book just generally about executive functioning. Um, Smart and Scattered and Star Smart and Scattered Teens are specifically um, about gifted students and executive functioning and all wonderful, wonderful reads. Um, and then there's also a list of books from Raising Lifelong Learners um, for teaching executive functioning skills. Um, and Becca, maybe you could pop in here a little bit to let um, anyone who's listening tonight know like where they'll be able to access the presentation to be able to access actually get to those links. Yeah, so um, I'm going to post the presentation on the DCAG-T website. And Rachel, um, I see you and I can um, uh, private message you the, the link. And anyone else who needs the link, if you um, want to type in the chat, I can private message the link so you guys don't have to go look for it. But it will be posted on the DCAG-T website. And it's www dcagt.org. Yes. And if you want more in-depth information, um, tonight we kind of did a general overview for you around executive functioning and just some, um, some informational pieces to get you started. But Tomorrow night, um, Lisa Van Gemmeret, um, otherwise known as the Gifted Guru, she's absolutely amazing. Um, she is also doing a Facebook Live session specifically about executive function um, functioning tomorrow night, which is the Conversations with CAGT. It's at 5 p.m. I highly recommend um, if you're able to watch it live tomorrow or go, they always have the recordings posted for you to access later, um, to go and um, access that later and watch um, what she has to say as well for going more in depth. And she's always wonderful with strategies um, that you can take and use right away. And then we have our contact information. So our general um, email address for gifted education at dcsdk12.org. Um, Christina Levesque is our amazing assistant and we have her phone number and email address there. And then Michelle and I both have our email addresses here as well, if you'd like to reach out to either one of us. All right, wonderful. So thank you both. So now we have reached the Q&A um, part of our live. So please drop your comments in the chat. Um, I will ask the questions to the speakers. Um, if you prefer to be anonymous, you can email info, I-N-F-O at dcagt.org and I can um, uh, read your email from there and um, not identify who you are. Um, all right. So with that, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing so that okay. I can. 
are amazing. And with that, I am also going to um, add Natasha Stringer to our stream. Hi, Natasha. So Natasha is the Director of Advanced Academics and Gifted Programming for um, Douglas County School District. So she's joining us for the this part of the Q&A. Um, so we are now open for questions. Um, so please uh, enter your questions in the chat and we will get started. All right. So with that, um, the first question we have is from Rachel, and she asks, what are some strategies for improving working memory? Um, I, I don't mind taking that if, if that's oh. okay. Um, so a lot of working memory strategies is just really a lot of practice. Um, depending on the age of the child, you can start fairly early with um, working on uh, games that build, like memory games that build off of, you know, having to figure out where the pieces are located. Um, and then uh, working from multi-step directions. So we have this, and then we do this, then we do this. And, you know, starting with that scaffolding of, um, you know, giving them a list that has it broken down with little pictures or whatever, and then maybe moving it to a symbol and then, you know, eventually taking that away so that they build up that memory for routine. Um, but working memory um, really takes just practice more than anything else um, to to help bring around some of those. Um, some of our twice exceptional students may actually have a deficiency in working memory. And um, while we can't overcome all of it, we can help to strengthen it. And I'm going to add on to Heather there too, like when she was talking about the tasks with like little pictures, the more you can present um, information in a variety of ways with visual, auditory, um, and more the more um, dimensions that you can present information, the more opportunity we're giving students to connect to prior knowledge, which is another thing to kind of layer on how you can help them build a bridge from something they already know and know well and are in their memory, uh, because that will help um, quicken that process, the better um, chances students have of um, acquiring that knowledge and being able to make those shifts and connections and develop that working memory. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I think that I probably need to um, work with my student on some of these things. <laughs> we, we might need to start tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Um, and um, Susan, I will definitely send you the link. Kelly, I'll send you the link as well. Um, feel free to um, leave more questions uh, in the comments. We definitely want to be able to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and in the meantime, I actually um, had a question. So my student who uh, wishes to remain anonymous at all times, <laughs> um, she and I are uh, struggling with the fact that um, she is working on her life skill of time management. Mm -hmm. And I am struggling with not telling her how to do it my way. And I'm trying to let it her do it her way. Um, what are some strategies that you can um, provide to parents who are trying to do the right thing and back off, um, but not go crazy at the same time? All right, who wants to take that? Natasha, do you want to take it? <laughs> um, I think that that is um, life goals for parents to <laughs> have our teenagers do things our way and let them explore their own way. Um, I think just both 
professional and personal experience, I would start with looking at some of the resources that um, Heather and Michelle mentioned. The um, one specifically written for teenagers, I think you did mention that, Michelle, mm -hmm. the Smart But Scattered for Teens is really written in um, teen friendly language and gives them some tips and tools, which again, my teenagers do not like it when I say tips, I don't know why, but it gives, it's written in um, language for teenagers with a lot of anecdotes by teenagers and gives them some places to start. So I think two things, one is guiding them toward resources for themselves with the end goal of, um, like Heather mentioned, their own reason why they need to work on their time management. So it really can't be because you need them to be on time or you need them to um, manage their time better. It needs to be kind of what's the return on their investment? What are they gonna get out of it? Which is just human nature. Um, to change any habit, we have to personally know what we're gonna get out of it to put the time or the effort in to change our behavior. So. Um, and I know that in that book or that resources in, resource in particular, it has some exercises to walk students through, like what's going to be their benefit. Um, mm -hmm. Once they've determined for themselves that it's a goal that they have and it's not a goal that their parents have for them, um, then they can look at here are some strategies that work for different kinds of thinkers and different kinds of learners. There are other um, resources you might be able to connect with at your at the school level. I know many of our schools, and, and I know at least one of your children right now is in an e-learning environment, Becca, so this might not help you so much, but um, many of our schools use or have resources for students to learn about themselves as a learner and a person. Um, so some of our students use, or some of our schools use Step Emergenetics, others use some materials that have been created by um, other organizations for kids to understand themselves as learners better. And so those are places that you as a parent could connect with the GT facilitator at your child's school, um, even in e-learning and say, what does your school overall learn as far as teaching kids about themselves and how they work and learn best? And for example, with Step Emergenetics, depending on their thinking preferences and behavior profile, they provide resources for students to look themselves to say, if you are a conceptual thinker, here are some ways you can work through your strengths to manage your time, to complete tasks, to set goals. Mm -hmm. So I would say two things, look at the, some of the resources that Heather and Michelle provided, um, and especially look at how do you set up ways for this to become their idea, so to speak, and figure out why it's going to benefit them in the short term. Um, we know that even adults have uh, a difficult time sometimes setting long term goals, especially with our um, teenagers and younger students and students who may struggle with executive functioning. Setting long term goals just doesn't like they can't see past the end of the day or tomorrow. So really thinking about how is this gonna make you feel better? What's your benefit short term? And then pointing them in the direction of um, some small step strategies to take. Um, e even if it's just tracking certain things very, you know, in small chunks, um, that would be the first thing. And then secondly, reach out to the GT facilitators to talk about how are you teaching students these kinds of strategies and how are you teaching them to learn more about themselves as a learner at the school? And how could you tap into that as a parent and make sure those conversations and those strategies are aligned? That was a really long answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was a really great answer, so thank you very much. Yeah, I'm gonna um, get that book right after this is over. And I love the exercises. I think that that will really help, so thank you. All right, so our next question is from Kelly, and um, it asks, do you have any suggestions on how to motivate my seven-year-old to complete work that is too easy for her, but is due to the teacher? So he has had negative experiences from kindergarten through now from teachers who don't know how to work with a gifted child with ADHD and lack of executive functioning skills. Okay, I'll take that one, yeah. if you don't mind. Um, so uh, it, there's a few different parts to the, the answer to this question. So first of all, um, this 
one of the reasons that teachers walk students through step-by-step -step instructions is try in trying to develop these executive functioning skills. Um, but when they're doing it for a gifted child and, that has already learned um, whatever content they're using, a lot of times those gifted children will shut down and then they don't actually learn how to do the step-by-step -step pieces that the the teachers are trying to teach. Um, so the first thing is that I would encourage your child to become an advocate with your support to be able to have those conversations with the teacher. Um, there's a GT facilitator at every single school and you can um, talk to the GT facilitator as well on you know what those classroom experiences look like for your child and then um, being able to have some support with the GT facilitator to be able to um, make that connection with the teacher. Um, motivation can be really hard for kids to do something that they already know and they feel like they've already shown the teacher that they, they know how to do this. So that's where that advocacy piece comes in um, really handy. They need to be able to respectfully approach the teacher and say, you know, I know how to do this. Um, so instead of writing a sentence about that, can I, you know, write a booklet about this? Or um, I already know these math facts within, you know, 100. Can I do something else and be able to, I don't know, look at things a little bit differently? It's it gets really tiring for GT kiddos to keep having to do things over and over again. Um, and so that need for challenge is something that they need to learn about who they are as a learner and be able to, to advocate fairly quickly. Great, thank you, Heather. So our next question is from Bill. And um, he says, wondering if you can expand a bit on the transition from middle to high school. That sounds like a Natasha question. Um, yeah, I'm gonna ask a, a follow-up question. Um, there's a lot of information about transition from, from middle school to high school. So um, I don't I don't know, Bill, if you can type in the um, in the Facebook Live, type in the chat, maybe a more specific question. I'm going to just give you some um, generalities if you're talking about overall executive functioning. Um, I, I guess I'm not really sure how to respond to that. I think it really depends on your student. And again, back to something Heather or potentially Michelle said earlier is looking at the executive functioning skills necessary, necessary to support um, multiple classes, multiple times, which many of our, our um, middle schools, I'm sorry, I'm gonna back up. Was the question elementary to middle or middle to high? Middle to middle high. high. Middle to high, okay. So I, I would suggest taking a look at what your student's schedule looks like in, in middle school. For many of our middle school students, they're already working on skills to be successful in multiple teachers, multiple classrooms, following a bell schedule. So many of the same executive functioning skills necessary to be successful in our middle school carry forward into high school. Obviously, there is a gradual release of responsibility for students um, where there may be um, students who have more flexibility in their time management or managing their time um, in their homework time or being able to, let's say, manage more difficult courses with um, extracurricular activities. Typically, if we've um, if we've worked together and done a good job of course placement and putting students in classes from middle school to high school, we shouldn't see a, a large leap in how difficult those courses in and of themselves are. So that doesn't happen 100% across the board, but what I tell families who are oftentimes worried about um, the difficulty of the course content being um, so much greater than middle school, it, it, usually that does not become a reality. Usually the students are just really in a class that is the next right course for them. 
Um, so with that fear alleviated, it's really looking at what are the skills that your child is using right now to make him or her successful in middle school. And if there are gaps in those, then you want to want to drill down into those particular areas that need support. Um, and if I know that, I might be able to point you in the right direction. And Natasha, um, I just saw that he um, responded. So it's he says workload, it's overloading on honors courses. OK, so I think that I, I'm going to point you a little bit back in the direction to the Facebook Live opportunity that I think we had last month in December um, about course placement and transition specific to middle school to high school, because I think what you're asking is a, a broader topic or a broader question about determining the right courses for students. So again, um, the you know, you want to look at your child's executive functioning skills, but what we don't want is for gaps in those skills to be um, to preclude students from the courses that have the content that is right for them or matches their ability and potential. So um, that is a very nuanced question. But what I would say is, um, while we, I would say that warrants a conversation specific to your child and their needs based on, I can't give an overarching um, answer, except that we do not want executive functioning skills, again, I'm gonna say this, to preclude them from being in a course that is a match for their potential skills and need. So we don't wanna keep them out of honors courses because we're afraid they won't be able to manage the workload. That's a conversation to have with that your child's counselor and department chairs or a, a contact a GT facilitator at the high school where they're matriculating to talk specifically about your child. We don't want that to be a roadblock. roadblock. Rather, we wanna create structures and supports for your child so that we can provide access to the content that is what your child needs um, if, he, if they have gaps or they have areas that they need to work on in executive functioning. Um, I don't know, Heather and Michelle, is there another way you want to say that or something else you want to address? I just, I think that's my... I would think there's only one other thing um, that the that your answer brought about with me and for the parents um, watching. I work with a small group of mental health professionals, counselors, psychologists, school social workers from both the elementary and secondary levels. and one thing that I have learned from them that I found absolutely fascinating is that when we, when you consider what we call neurotypical, so your typical growth, as far as social emotional skills, which executive functioning are part of, um, is that somewhere, and for every kid it's different, um, but from somewhere usually between 13 and kind of 14, 15-ish, there tends to be a plateau. And it happens, um, it's absolutely typical. It happens for everyone. It ties into that um, asynchronous development and the way the mind and the body can focus their energy in different areas and how it can split that energy. And that in the development of skills, there can almost seem, the way they express, the, our professionals expressed it to me was, it can almost seem as if um, the social, emotional, and sometimes the executive functioning skills for students at that age may seem to stop developing or skills that they seem to have had mastered disappear for a little bit. And that this is absolutely typical and every every student, every child pushes past it. But it tends to happen right at that kind of eighth grade year at some point, maybe towards seventh, maybe toward their freshman year, but as students are transitioning. And so, you know, that is something when we're thinking about generalization or about that transition, that it's good to know and keep in mind um, if that's something you're noticing in your student or if you're trying to help your child at home. And like Becca, you were asking about the time management and let's say they were making great strides in that and doing really well with their time management. And then all of a sudden it disappears um, that it isn't necessarily that they've lost those skills. It's that this there's this very neurotypical phenomenon that happens um, just right around that 13 to 14, 15 age with the development of not just executive functioning, but social emotional skills in general that would have an impact. 
Right. And I would point you just, you know, as you're continuing thinking about this and, and the intersection between course selection and course placement and that transition between middle school and high school, no, I'd refer back to a couple of the slides in the slide deck, especially looking at that trajectory of, well, <laughs> looking at slides eight, nine, and 10, and really thinking about the requisite skills that we're talking about or the skill sets that we're talking about in executive functioning. And then ref and looking at slide 12, looking at kind of those developmental spurt areas. Mm -hmm. um, and talking to your child, I mean, there is a there is an intersection between um, your child's task commitment and their um, you know their passion about a certain subject in an honors class. Um, we know students if they're passionate about something, they oftentimes will act very differently, and you'll see a different level of some of these executive functioning skills in an area in which they are passionate and committed. So we see this oftentimes in the difference between task commitment, flexibility, persistence, stress tolerance in a sport or in an extracurricular activity versus in um, a language arts class, let's say. So I think you do need to take into consideration um, those things that are very personal to your child, um, mm -hmm. because it may be that when you're looking at the whole picture, you know that if it's something that your child is really committed about and really wants to do well, um, their executive functioning skills show up a little bit differently. They work through their strengths, so to speak, to ensure that they um, are managing their time or they are um, finishing tasks that they've started. Um, so I think when you're thinking about honors classes, I would think about that. You also have to think about your child's whole picture the amount of time that they are spending outside of their academic areas, in addition to what they're passionate about. Um, you know, if you have someone who's spending 20 to 40 hours outside of school in a competitive sport, um, you might make some different decisions about their course load or the difficulty of that load, um, their freshman year as they're transitioning from middle school to high school. Um, versus someone who may not have very many extracurricular activities. The other thing I will say too is just like from elementary to middle, our teachers who teach our freshmen are very trained in um, that transition process. So they do not expect students to be college students on the first day of their freshman year. They don't really even expect them to be high school students. So my teaching background is in secondary and um, first quarter of freshman year is very much like teaching um, fourth quarter of eighth grade, sometimes even third quarter of eighth grade. So um, the teachers will help to build the executive functioning skills necessary for students to be successful in their class. They do not, um, just like with the content, they don't expect them to walk in with all the strategies and all the skills necessary to be successful in the same way that they would expect in third or fourth quarter. So I think there's also that to consider is um, we do scaffold our support for our students in those transition years to set them up for success. That is our goal. Our goal is to provide strategies for them to be successful, um, not to, uh, we don't have weed out courses in ninth grade like some of us may have experienced um, freshman year in college, right? Um, we're not trying to weed students out of classes. We're trying to set them up for success. So that's just a little um, qualitative piece of um, that if this is your first child transitioning into high school, just to keep in mind is that we want your child to succeed. Wonderful. Thank you, Natasha and Heather and Michelle. All right, so our next question is from Rachel. So is there a guideline between acceptable asynchronous development and requiring additional supports from a school such as a 504 or an IEP? Hmm. The guideline really between acceptable and requiring additional supports are going to live within um, the requirements and guidelines for qualification for a 504 and an IEP. So if that's something um, that you feel you need to pursue, 
I would contact your school's GT facilitator, um, their SPED department, their main contact, to have a conversation with them around your concerns, um, around more information, and really looking at those guidelines and a more targeted conversation about your student and what makes you think that that may be required. Um, that's that's one of those pieces that um, the guidelines are around qualification for a 504 or um, an IEP for um, special education are very stark in black and white and set um, set forth um, by the state and federal government. And so an individual conversation about your student and your concerns would definitely be required and how that those fit in with the guidelines that they already have. Um, I'm going to jump in and just add a little bit to that, Michelle. I would also point you in the direction um, on our website. We have some some resources that are family friendly resources specific to twice exceptionality. And in those resources, there are some charts that you can look at to see um, some uh, asynchronous some some characteristics of asynchronous development and how those might present for students who are twice exceptional. And we are going to um, have some uh, I think a, an opportunity on a Facebook Live to discuss twice exceptionality in more depth. But if your child has already been identified as gifted and or you suspect that he or she um, has characteristics of gifted learners and also characteristics that might be qualifiers for special education services or accommodations through a 504, those resources might just give you kind of a framework to say, this is how gifted characteristics might present if a child is um, is twice exceptional. It's also sometimes um, some of that asynchronous development, I know you're asking for a, for a threshold um, and there isn't really um, an agreed upon threshold, except like Michelle said, if you really are concerned that they may need special services through special education, um, that the, twice exception, the information on twice exceptionality may be a, a good place to start just to take a look at at what level those characteristics um, are exhibited in um, in your child's life and we we look a lot at multiple areas um, not only in academics but in their maybe their sports or extracurriculars or you know we, we kind of have a, a saying of you know multiple over time so multiple environments multiple times um, and looking at the um, the need of the student. And as Michelle said, definitely connect with your GT facilitator as a starting point, and they will be able to loop in the specialists in the building who are very well versed and experts in um, special education services and Section 504 plans and, and, um, and students who are best served through one of those two areas. All right, thank you. So we have just a few minutes left. So um, this will be our last question and this is from Amy. So how do you help kids that are flexing up a grade but may not have the executive functioning skills of that next grade level? So we have seen during e-learning days that flexing up a grade for math, working with the GT teacher for reading, and then working with the classroom teacher for other subjects has been quite an executive function conundrum. And um, her student is a third grader. I'll go ahead and take this one. Um, and I think this really gets to, again, that asynchronous development of when um, your child's needs in one area are significantly outpace their needs in another. And really the trick with executive functioning is the level of support they need in order to be successful in those other areas. So for example, probably one of the things that Amy, you're experiencing with your third grader is that switching of teachers and the time management. And so my first suggestion would be one to connect with these teachers as well as a parent and think through a plan of how to provide the support um, that will give them structures for time management at their level that will let them be successful then at the academic level that they need. <clears throat> and another piece of this is especially if um, the GT teacher facilitator is who you're working with too, 
to create structures that then um, when they leave the e-learning environment can be carried over to help continue to support their executive functioning skills and development, which my guess is are going to continue to be needed if they're being successful academically in these older level environments, yet their executive functioning does not quite support that. Um, so connecting with the teachers involved, providing the support and structures that will allow them to be successful, which might take um, some trial and error. Um, every student is different, um, especially when they're younger, at least they're a little more open to you providing suggestions. Um, usually, I shouldn't say always, but usually they're a little more open to you or their teachers providing suggestions and being able to try and, and do that and finding what can be successful. Heather, Natasha, anything you wanna add? Oh, well, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Sorry, I just want to add, I, I reread your question and I um I just want to emphasize the fact that we all, including adults, are feeling a strain on our executive functioning yeah. skills <laughs> in our current learning environments and working environments. So I say quite often that I um, you know, I'm working at, at about 60% capacity in all of my executive functioning skills on the days that I'm, you know, moving between multiple platforms. So I, I do wanna say that some things that you may be seeing, cause you mentioned this specific to your e-learning days, um, that is a strain for all students, even students who typically do not struggle with executive functioning. So I would ask, um, you know, on your days where, where that child is in person, do you see a different, a different picture and um, I'm, I'm assuming now, and maybe you're at a charter school, so you have some e-learning days and some in-person days. Um, I, I'm not sure what all of our, our charter schools are doing at this point, but um, while you're seeking and working with the GT facilitator and teachers to help support or scaffold for those e-learning days as they're happening, I would also just remind everyone to give ourselves and our students some grace because none of us seem to be operating at 100% um, in all of these areas as we've had to navigate new learning platforms um, and systems and structures, both in person and um, synchronous online. So um, just a little caveat. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so I just wanna say thank you very much to everyone who's joined us this evening. Um, thank you, Heather and Natasha and Michelle. We appreciate everyone's time. We hope you found this information helpful. Um, Bill, I will send you a link to um, the transition to middle to high school um, live so you can watch that. Um, if you have any questions for me, um, you can email info at dcagt.org and I will get back to you. Um, anyone who wanted the slides, I will send those out this evening. Um, we will have another live session soon. Um, we hope you'll join us. Um, we'll be sending out information on that. Um, and um, thank you very much. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you.